and give you an update on what's going on there. Uh, welcome to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Sunday, April 3rd, 2022. And we are live. Call in numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600. Is the call in number if you have a question or comment. So last Sunday when I was on the air, we know that the uh, 94th Oscars was taking place. And when I got off the when I got off the air last Sunday, I tuned into the Oscars, and that was after Will Smith slapped Chris Rock. And I was reading a few accounts of it on uh, on social media in some news articles, and I tuned in and saw Will Smith's acceptance speech, okay? And he did not thank Chris Rock in the acceptance speech. Now, you know, we talked about this on our show this past Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I didn't talk about it on Tuesday. Um, on Friday, Will Packer, who is the, um, who is the producer of the 94th uh, Oscars, Will Packer's African-American, uh, this was the first time you had an all African American production team. Will Packer headed this up. Uh, Friday morning on Good Morning America, Will Packer did an interview with TJ Holmes to explain what happened behind the scenes um, leading up to uh will smith losing control and slapping chris rock and what happened afterwards and it was a very very good interview we're going to share uh that interview with you um and then i'm, I'm also going to share with you what happened on roller martin unfiltered because when i was on roller martin unfiltered on friday the story broke live that uh will smith was resigning from the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences. Okay. He yes, he can still make movies. Some people are asking, does that mean he can't make movies? And yeah, he can still make movies. He just he doesn't have a vote when it comes to Oscars or business dealing with the Academy. Okay. So we're gonna break this down. We're gonna talk about this on the uh, on uh today's show. Um I wasn't live on the air Friday. I was doing Roland Martin Unfiltered on Friday. Uh, I'm going to share a couple segments from Roland Martin and Filter where we talked about this. We talked about the breaking news story. We talked about the uh, fantastic interview that um, we did. We talked about the fantastic interview that TJ Holmes did with Will Packer also. OK, so we'll break that down uh, on today's show. Now, there was a I saw a, a follow Angela Yee on. Uh, Facebook from the Breakfast Club, and there was a really good interview that uh, the Breakfast Club did with uh, Chris Rock uh, before the Oscars. I'm not sure how how uh, recent it is. I know it's recent, but I'm not sure how soon it was before the Oscars. But it was before the Oscars. And in this interview, Chris Rock talks about having a nonverbal uh, learning disorder. Nonverbal learning disorder. OK, we're going to share that with you as well, because uh, it, it sheds a lot of light into Chris Rock. I, I know I've seen interviews where he talked about being bullied as a kid and beaten up as a kid. He went to, uh, uh, you know, he was one of the students that integrated the high school. So he talked about being bullied as, as a child. Um, and he, he talks about letting people take advantage of him, things like this, run over him, et cetera. Uh, and we also know Will Smith has had challenges as well, had to go through therapy, had challenges and had to deal with uh, uh, seeing his father abuse his mother. And he wrote about this in his book that came out about a year ago or so. And he's talked about this also. Um, D.L. Hughley um, did a, a segment on his show where he talked about what happens when black trauma meets black trauma. What happens when black trauma meets black trauma? And here you have two wealthy African American men who've had traumatic, who who have survived a traumatic past, and they've gone through therapy and things like this. And then those two uh, men who've been through trauma collided. 
Okay. And this is one of the reasons why mental health is so important. This is one of the reasons why mental health is so important. But but what happens when black trauma meets black trauma? Okay. And mental health is something that's, you know, taboo in the African American community. But if it's anybody who needs mental health, it's those that have survived white supremacy and racism and are the brunt of white supremacy and racism. That's African Americans. Okay. So uh, I'm going to share that uh, segment with you as well. Uh, so we'll share the clip from uh, Roland Martin and Filtered also. Um, and then th this is some news that's going to make some people happy and some people scared, I guess, also. Um, on Friday, I think it was Friday, Friday, the House of, the House of Representatives passed a bill to decriminalize marijuana okay friday the house of representatives passed the bill the vote was 220 to 204 to decriminalize marijuana uh at the federal level we know that you've had uh 37 states in washington and washington dc have legalized using medicinal marijuana we know a number of states have legalized um uh, recreational marijuana but it's still illegal at the federal level OK, and what that means is, is that mar marijuana dispensaries can't open up bank accounts in the name of that marijuana dispensary. Uh, so there's still um, challenges at the federal level. Now, this bill has to pass. The Senate has to go to the Senate. It's going to take 60 votes in the Senate, which means 10 Republicans are going to have to vote for it. Now, there's some crazy Republicans in the Senate, not as crazy as the House, but there's some crazy Republicans in the Senate. And. You know, if I had to bet, I think there are at least 10 Republicans in the Senate that use drugs. I mean, just from the crazy things that they say. I'm not going to call any names. You can figure some of them out yourself. But <laughs> but um, we're going to talk about this now. Um, so we'll talk about this bill passing the House of Representatives by a vote of 220 to 204. Only three Republicans, only three Republicans voted for the bill one of them was sugar daddy matt gates who is possibly facing uh charges of having sex with underage teens we'll see but sugar daddy matt gates voted for this but there's something else that's really important when we look at this story as well okay and i i, I hear on radio shows people say uh whether marijuana should be legal or illegal right and I've heard this I've heard this conversation on radio shows across, you know, for years, whether they're nasty national radio shows or local radio shows. But what people nine times out of 10 don't ask the question about or don't ask the question is why was marijuana made illegal in the first place? See, this is this is why you have to understand history. You have to understand what happened to get you to where you are right now. What were the laws and policies that were put in place? OK, marijuana was legal up until 1937. The question we should ask ourselves is why was it made illegal? As long as as long as white people were using marijuana, it wasn't a problem when non-white people started using it and especially african americans now it became a problem and the reason why marijuana was made illegal in 1937 is rooted in racism and we can trace a lot of this back to uh the man who uh headed up the federal bureau of narcotics and he's also the same man who's he was a white supremacist a virulent racist he also persecuted billy holiday this was depicted in the in the movie United States versus Billy Holiday. I'm talking about Harry J. Anslinger. When you talk about the history of why marijuana was made illegal, you have to go back to Harry J. Anslinger. So we're going to talk about that on today's show as well. Okay. And also I'll share a segment of uh, uh I did an impromptu presentation at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History in front of their uh underground railroad display. All right. So <laughs> I'll share some of that with you also. And then we'll let you know about the online classes I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. 
and uh, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. And uh, we'll also give you some information about the uh, One Africa Conference that's coming to Detroit, um, April, Saturday, April 30th, and Sunday, May 1st. Um, Hapi presents One Africa Power and Unity Conference. Dr. Linda Jeffries will be there. Professor James Small uh, is going to be at Dr. Malefe Kete Asante. It's going to be a number of people that will be there as well. All right. All right. Call in numbers 313-778-7600. If you have a question or comment, listen to the After History Network show. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. The work that I do is larger than the fashion industry. It's larger than the art world. And I believe that I was born to bring newness into this world. I'm Kaima McIntyre. I'm 24 years old and I'm an artist. I create everything from paintings to jewelry design, metaphysical jewelry to be specific, and fashion design. The only reason why my prom dress went viral is because people needed it. Within a few days of going viral, Notori Naughton reached out to me and she's like, I saw your dress, can you make me a dress? I was equally as shocked to be asked by a celebrity to design their dress at the age of 17. That's just one person and the list just continues to go on to Janet Jackson, to Tyra Banks. It really hits home. That means that the discussion is happening on the grounds in real time. Back to the African History Network. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the future radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, April 3rd, 2022, and we are live. Call in numbers 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. All right, I want to go to this first story here in just a second. Now, on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it's correct your own behavior, what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you can chose the covers of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now, we deal with a number of different topics here on the African History Network show. We deal with current events in history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828. To sign up for our email newsletter, text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter or visit our website africanhistorynetwork.com africanhistorynetwork.com all right so i want to go to this first story here um so on good morning america friday morning april 1st they had an excellent interview with will packer who was the producer of the 94th uh academy awards and uh, we're going to clip one in just a second, Taylor. Uh, he shed a lot of light on what happened leading up to the incident and what happened afterwards. Good Morning America has a really good article. GoodMorningAmerica.com. Oscars producer Will Packer opens up about what happened behind the scenes after Will Smith uh, slapped Chris Rock. All right. And there's a lot of nonsense floating around on social media. No TMZ. If you go back and watch the, uh, my show from uh, Thursday, uh, Thursday, March 31st, 2022, you know, I dealt with the, the story from uh, uh, TMZ that says the Academy lied about um, asking Will Smith to, to lead things like that. But when I go and looked at, uh, first of all, it says Academy lied about asking him to leave dot, dot, dot sources. That's what the article said. When you read the article, they cited three unnamed sources. Okay. And I have a problem with all these unnamed sources talking. I mean, tell us who you are. Will Packer sat down for an interview. He's not an unnamed source. Okay. But the articles that were written 
previously, like the day before the one came out uh, on Thursday, uh, 8, 10 a.m. from uh, TMZ that said Academy lied about asking him to leave sources, uh, uh, by asking him to leave. The articles in uh, New York Times, Washington Post, NBC News, things like this that wrote about the Academy asking him to leave and he refused. They didn't go back and update those articles with this information from unnamed sources, which usually means when you have credible news organizations that don't do that, that usually means that the that the the later report is not accurate. That's usually what that means. OK, let, uh, let's go to clip number one, uh, Taylor. Interview with Oscar show producer Will Packer, TJ. Of course, you spoke with him about the moment that stunned the world, the moment that everyone is still talking about. But you remember how excited he was in the red carpet when we yes, talked to him? I do. He was so giddy to have this moment, an all black um, Oscar producing team for the first time. And then this moment kind of took all that away from him. But he gave us some interesting detail about what's going on behind the scenes and also just how close Will Smith might have come to being arrested. It sounds like Chris Rock had the ability, the option, to have the LAPD go arrest and remove Will Smith from that theater that night. That's an absolute fact. The LAPD made it clear, we will do whatever you want us to do. And one of the options is that we will go and arrest him right now. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. Will Smith just smacked the out of it. That moment came after what we now know was an unscripted joke from Rock about Smith's wife, Jada Pinkett Smith, who's recently been vocal about her battle with alopecia. Jada, I love you. G.I. Jane, too. Can't wait to see it. All right? You're sitting, monitors around you. Tell me what's in your room around you. I said, watch this. He's going to kill. Because I knew he had an amazing lineup of jokes that we had. We had him in the prompter. And ultimately, he did not get to one joke. He didn't tell one of the planned jokes. He was just immediately freestyling. But I thought this was part of something that Chris and Will were doing on their own. I thought it was a bit. I thought it was a bit like everybody else. I knew we had practiced it. Not concerned. I wasn't concerned at all. As he's walking. I figured, okay, you know. He's going to say something or come at him. Something funny is going to happen because that's the nature of Chris and that's the nature of Will. So let's see what happens. Keep my first name out of your mouth. I'm going to, okay? Once I saw Will yelling at the stage with such vitriol, my heart dropped. And I just remember thinking, oh, no. Oh, no. Not like this. And Chris was keeping his head when everybody else was losing theirs. But my heart at that point was just in my stomach because of everything about it and what it represented and what it looked like and who was involved. All of that was just, um, I, I never felt so immediately devastated like I did at that moment. But it still wasn't until Rock walked backstage that Packer was finally convinced that Smith had actually struck him. The winners are walking off stage Chris is with them, and I immediately go up to Chris. And you say what, or you do what? And I said, did he really hit you? And he looked at me, and he goes, yeah. He goes, I just took a punch from Muhammad Ali, and only Chris can. He was immediately, you know, in, in joke mode, but you could tell that he was uh, very much still in shock. I made that clear. Like, Rob, you tell me. Whatever you want to do, brother. And he was telling me, I'm fine. Let's just get past this. I'm getting out of here. I can't believe this happened. The LAPD came and needed to talk to Chris. And so they came into my office and they were laying out very clearly what Chris's rights were. And they were saying, this is battery. We will go get him. We are prepared. We're prepared to get him right now. You can press charges. We can arrest him. As they were talking, Chris was, um, he was being very dismissive of those options. He was like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. He was like, no, no, no. And even to the point where I said, I said, Rock, let him, let him finish. And they said, you know, would you like us to take any action? And he said, no. He said, no. And I didn't have any conversation with Will. But the Academy says they asked Smith to leave, which he refused. 
a lot of folks immediately will wonder why he got up, walked that far, assaulted somebody, went back to his seat and was allowed to stay. Right. What was the conversation behind the scenes? That happened to be right before uh, the Best Actor Award. Shayla told me that they were about to physically remove Will Smith. And I had not been a part of those conversations. And so I immediately went to the academy leadership that was on site and I said, Chris Rock doesn't want that. I said, Rock has made it clear that he does not want to make a bad situation worse. That was Chris's energy. His tone was not retaliatory. His tone was not aggressive and angry. And so I was advocating what Rock wanted in that time, which was not to physically remove Will Smith at that time. Because as it has now been explained to me, that was the only option at that point. It has been explained to me that there was a conversation that I was not a part of to ask him to voluntarily leave. Will Smith later said on Instagram, I would like to publicly apologize to you, Chris. I was out of line and I was wrong. I'm embarrassed and my actions were not indicative of the man I want to be. When did you finally get a chance to touch base with Will Smith? Will Smith um, reached out to me the next morning and said, uh, and he apologized. And he said, you know, this, um, this should have been a gigantic moment for you. And he expressed uh, his embarrassment, and um, and that was the extent of it. Will Folks at home who had just seen the assault minutes later are now watching a room, mostly of the folks in the room, giving a standing ovation to that guy. Yeah. Who had just assaulted somebody. Yeah. You know, um, I probably have a different right. perspective on pause that. It, pause it right there. Pause it right there, Taylor. Pause the clip right there, Taylor. Okay, back it up about 30 seconds or a minute. We're going to pick this up on the other side of the break. We'll go to the phone lines also, and uh, I'll let you hear what happened when I was on Roland Martin Unfiltered. You listen to the African History Network show on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Jeanette Davis is a well-established author with six published books. Black Survival in White America from Past History to the Next Century was published in 1995, and it delves into the history of African Americans before slavery up to contemporary times. The Great Divide Between Blacks and Whites was released in 2008, and her autobiography, Black Just Like My Mama, was published in 2010. Soulful Journey, the Business of Beings was released in December 2021 and her two latest books, Echoes from the Heart, Love Throws Poetry, and Master Being Human were both published in January of 2022. Jeanette Davis' writings delve deeply into the psyche of black people from ancient to contemporary times. She cuts no corners and leaves no stones unturned in relating truth, letting the chips fall where they may on both African and European doorsteps. Order Jeanette Davis's books today at Amazon.com. Search for Jeanette Davis and get to know her work today. STEM Forward, helping our community find their place in the emerging fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Join us for our monthly live stream on our website, stemforwardedu.org. Watch, subscribe, share. Also join our mailing list to stay up to date with STEM resources and opportunities. STEM Forward, the future is now. Watch, subscribe, share. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. All right, give us a call, 313-778-7600 if you have a quick question or comment. 313-778-7600 if you have a quick question or comment. So uh, right before the break, I was sharing with you uh, the interview that Will Packer, who is not an unnamed source, he wasn't somebody who... Uh, heard from somebody that heard from somebody that heard from the hairdresser about what happened. He was actually there. <laughs> Will Packer is the man who headed up the production team for the 94th Oscars. Okay. This is the first time there's been an all African-American 
production team. TJ Holmes did an exclusive interview with Will Packer Friday, uh, April 1st, 2022 on Good Morning America. And Will Packer was explaining what happened leading up to the incident where Will Smith exploded and slapped Chris Rock and what happened afterwards. He talked about how Chris Rock uh, kept his cool, kept his head and did not want to press charges against Will Smith, the LAPD. Uh, he's, uh, Will Packer said the LAPD made it clear we will do whatever you want us to do. And one of the options is that we will go and arrest him right now, referring to Will Smith. Uh, let's go back to this clip, uh, Taylor. Are now watching a room, mostly the folks in the room, giving a standing ovation to that guy. Yeah. Who had just assaulted somebody. Yeah. You know, um, I probably have a different perspective on that, TJ, because I'm, I'm, I was in the room and I know a lot of those people. I don't think that these were people that were applauding anything at all about that moment. And all these people saw their friend at his absolute worst moment and were hoping that they could encourage him and lift him up and that he would somehow try to make it better. Do you wish Will Smith had left after that? Did he, do you wish he did not remain a part of your ceremony? It couldn't be made right in that moment because of what had happened. But I think we were hoping that he would make it better, that he would stand on that stage and say what just happened minutes ago was absolutely and completely wrong. Chris Rock, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. That's what, that's what I was hoping for. If he wasn't going to give that speech, which made it truly better, then yes. Yes. You talk so much about how great the energy was in that room. Yeah. After the incident. Yeah. What happened to the energy in the room? Sucked completely out of it. It was like somebody poured concrete in that room. Because Chris handled the moment with such grace and aplomb, it allowed the show to continue. It was such a huge moment and such a, uh, a, a sad and disappointing moment that it wasn't something that we were going to come back from. Chris Rock saved the Oscars that night. Did he save the show that night? Mm. I think he did. I think he did. It's just remarkable how honest and how yeah. authentic. I mean, he's not he's not lawyered up. He's not telling you what you know you want to hear. He's just telling you what happened. And he's telling you about his experience. And yeah. we, we heard more about. Look, we saw on stage how big of a man that Chris Rock was. Mm -hmm. He was an even bigger man behind the scenes. Is, what it's amazing to hear. Yeah. I, I'm really glad he pointed that out. Incredible interview. And uh, thank awesome. you for bringing it to us. I know a lot of us are just. Wanting more, actually. All right. And our thanks to Will. Back here again <laughs> for sitting down with you. Well, hey All right, there, GMA Pause it right there. Pause it right thanks there, Taylor. Our YouTube channel. Pause it right there. Thank you. Uh, we're going to clip two in just a second, the second part of that interview. Okay. So now the difference between Will Packer doing an interview and a lot of people on social media talking that don't know Chris Rock, don't know Will Smith, weren't there weren't involved in 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 uh producing the oscars will packer was there I mean, he's explaining to you what happened he's explaining to you also how chris rock kept his head and kept and kept going and he he talked about how they had a number of jokes loaded up into the teleprompter for chris rock to say chris rock didn't get to one joke he was just freestyling which oftentimes is what comedians do they freestyle they ad lib OK, um, but he didn't get to any of the jokes in the teleprompter. OK, we're going to clip two in just a second. This is the second part of the interview. And then uh, on the other side of the break, because I we probably won't be able to get to this before we go to the next break. Uh, we discussed this on Roland Martin Unfiltered on Friday. Now, on Friday, we were already scheduled to talk about the Good Morning America interview that Will Packer did. But while we were on the air live. The story broke 
about Will Smith resigning from the Academy of Motion uh, Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. That story broke while we were on the air live. And when stories like this break live on the air in this business, what you do is you roll with it. <laughs> that's when that's what we did. OK, so you, you're going to hear that. I've, I've had news stories break when I was on the air, when when I was on Cliff Russell's show. I was a guest on Cliff Russell's show. We know Cliff Russell passed away a few years ago. He was a host here on that. The story about story, Stormy, Stormy Daniels, the Stormy Daniels story broke in about Donald Trump paying her hush money. That story broke when we live on the air. And I, I was the one that actually broke that story for 9, 10 a.m. Superstation. All right. Um, so let, let's go to uh, clip two, uh, Taylor. This is going to be Will Packer, the Oscars lead producer. Hey, DJ. Hey there, George. I, I was on the red carpet on Sunday, and Will Packer and his wife, Heather, and his producing partner, Shayla Cowan, actually came by for an interview, and they were over the moon excited. They were so excited. They put in six months of work to get to this point. They were so excited about the show. And they told me, Will told me yesterday in that interview, that after the first act, they were actually high-fiving. And it had a tear come through their eye because the show was going so well. And then in one split second moment incident on that stage, they felt like they were robbed. And the Oscar goes to. Will Smith! Bill Smith won his first Oscar Sunday and got a standing ovation. This was minutes after slapping Chris Rock on stage. Show producer Will Packer says the optics of celebrating Smith so soon after that shocking moment weren't lost on him, but offered another viewpoint. You know, um, I probably have a different perspective on that, TJ, because I'm, I'm, I was in the room and I know a lot of those people. And so it wasn't like this was somebody they didn't know. It doesn't make anything that he did right. It doesn't excuse that behavior at all. But I think that the people in that room who stood up stood up for somebody who they knew, right? Who was a peer, who was a friend, who was a brother, who has a three decades plus long career of being the opposite of what we saw in that moment. I think these people saw the person that they know and were hoping that somehow, some way, this was an aberration. He's going to stand on stage and maybe Chris Rock comes from the back and says, ah, we got you all. You know, um, I, I, I don't think that these were people that were applauding anything at all about that moment. And all these people saw their friend at his absolute worst moment and were hoping that they could encourage him and lift him up and that he would somehow try to make it better. Smith apologized to the Academy and his fellow nominees during his acceptance speech, but not to Chris Rock, something Packer says was a missed opportunity after striking Rock. Do you wish Will Smith had left after that? Did he, do you wish he did not remain a part of your ceremony? I think what many of us were hoping was that he would go on that stage and make it better. It couldn't be made right in that moment because of what had happened. But I think we were hoping that he would make it better, that he would stand on that stage and say what just happened minutes ago was absolutely and completely wrong. Chris Rock, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. That's what, that's what I was hoping for. I felt like he was going to win, and I was hoping that if he stayed, he said that. Art imitates life. I look like the crazy father, just like they said. <laughs> I look like crazy father, just like they said about Richard Williams. Um, but love will make you do crazy things. If he wasn't going to give that speech, which made it truly better, then yes. Yes, because now you don't have the optics of somebody who committed this act, didn't nail it in terms of a conciliatory acceptance speech in that moment, 
who then continue to be in the room. But just an hour before Will Smith's Oscar win, the 94th Academy Awards was celebratory. A renewed energy, vibe, and flair to the ceremony. <laughs> There were show-stopping musical numbers. <laughs> and three hosts delivering laughs. Where movie lovers unite and watch TV. Mm. <laughs> but that all changed in an instant. You talk so much about how great the energy was in that room. Yeah. After the incident. Yeah. What happened to the energy in the room? Sucked completely out of it. It was like somebody poured concrete in that room. It was um, this feeling of what just happened. Is this real? How am I supposed to react? So okay, pause it right there. Just backed it up about 30 seconds or so, Taylor. We're going to pick this up on the other side of the break. Then we're going to, uh, I'm going to share with you what happened on Roller Martin Unfiltered when we discussed this on Friday as well. Uh, and and Will, uh, Will Smith put out a statement saying he was resigning from the Academy of uh, Motion Picture, Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences over what happened. And uh, we discussed this on Roller Martin Unfiltered also. OK, you listen to the African History Network show on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Jeanette Davis is a well-established author with six published books. Black Survival in White America from Past History to the Next Century was published in 1995 and it delves into the history of African Americans before slavery up to contemporary times. The Great Divide Between Blacks and Whites was released in 2008 and her autobiography, Black Just Like My Mama, was published in 2010. Soulful Journey, the Business of Beings was released in December 2021 and her two latest books, Echoes from the Heart, Love Throws Poetry, and Master Being Human were both published in January of 2022. Jeanette Davis' writings delve deeply into the psyche of black people from ancient to contemporary times. She cuts no corners and leaves no stones unturned in relating truth, letting the chips fall where they may on both African and European doorsteps. Order Jeanette Davis's books today at Amazon.com. Search for Jeanette Davis and get to know her work today. The work that I do is larger than the fashion industry, it's larger than the art world. And I believe that I was born to bring newness into this world. I'm Kaima McIntyre, I'm 24 years old and I'm an artist. I create everything from paintings to jewelry design, metaphysical jewelry to be specific, and fashion design. The only reason why my prom dress went viral is because people needed it. Within a few days of going viral, Notori Naughton reached out to me and she's like, I saw your dress, can you make me a dress? I was equally as shocked to be asked by a celebrity to design their dress at the age of 17. That's just one person and the list just continues to go on to Janet Jackson, to Tyra Banks. It really hits home. That means that the discussion is happening on the grounds in real time. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation of Future Radio. All right. Hey, I want to let you know that we are celebrating the 12th year anniversary of me broadcasting the African History Network show. I first started uh, March 10th, 2010 uh, and started on the Harambe Radio Network. And I've been here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation for six years, April 2022. So we're celebrating overall our 12th year anniversary of me uh hosting the african history network show uh you can support the african history network uh dollar sign the ahn show through cash app dollar sign the ahn show through cash app also through paypal paypal.me forward slash the ahn show and uh we have the information here in the thread of the broadcast but it's also on the home page of our website africanhistorynetwork.com if you do it through cash app uh our Cash app tag is dollar sign the AHN show, S H O W. It'll say Michael and show my picture there on our Cash app, um, uh, on our Cash app page. Uh, these other ones here are fake African History Network Cash app accounts that have been stealing money from us. Um, and I'm trying to get them shut down. So if 
you sent money to them mistakenly, uh, you can contact Cash App and let them know that uh, you sent it to the wrong account. We have our link here for Cash App and a, bu a button for PayPal also. So that helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, pay some of the bills, et cetera. And uh, you can also register for the online classes I teach on, uh, online history classes I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. On Saturdays, it's, um, well, actually now the classes are basically all archived. Um, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'a for understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And uh, we had a great class on Saturday. Uh, as soon as you register, there's nine weeks of courses, uh, nine weeks of classes that you can watch that are already archived. Classes on sale, $60, regularly $130. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Okay. And uh, we'll post a link here for that also. But that's at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All right, I want to go back to our lead story uh, from the top of the hour. From the top of the hour, um, Will Packer, who was the producer of the ninety fourth Oscars, did an exclusive interview with ABC News, and he explained what happened uh, leading up to uh, and after the incident with Will Smith and Chris Rock. Okay. And he shed a lot of light and cleared up a lot of misinformation floating around on social media. No, it wasn't staged. If you don't know the difference between something staged and something real, I really don't know what to tell you. Um, and two, um, he shared uh, information dealing with the uh, Chris Rock was the one who did not want Will Smith arrested, did not want Will Smith removed because the LAPD, Will Packer said the LAPD made it clear we will do whatever you want us to do. And one of the options is that we will go and arrest him right now. Let's go back to the second part of uh, this interview, uh, Taylor. It was like somebody poured concrete in that room. It was um, this feeling of what just happened. Is this real? How am I supposed to react? So it sucked the life out of that room and it never came back. Packer credits Chris Rock for his composure, which may very well have salvaged the night. Because Chris handled the moment with such grace and aplomb, it allowed the show to continue. And if he had handled that differently in that moment, which it could have gone so many different ways. And because Chris continued the way that he did. He completed the category. He handed the trophy to Quest Love with somebody else who I oh feel like was really uh, robbed of their moment. Thank you. It gave us license in a way to continue the show, which is what we were trying to do. It was such a huge moment and such a, uh, a, a sad and disappointing moment that it wasn't something that we were gonna come back from within that night within this week i don't know when we'll come back and people will be talking about anything else other than the show chris rock saved the oscars that night did he save the show that night hmm. i think he did i think he did he, he he certainly saved what was left of it at that point the night was filled with history making feel-good moments Packer led the first all-black producing team ariana debose became the first afro-latina queer woman to win an acting oscar coda won big I just wanted to say that this is dedicated to the deaf community, the CODA community, and the disabled community. And also a big win of the night. After years of declining viewership, the ceremony rose over 60% from last year's broadcast. A lot of people, they, they hear the ratings went up and they, they think uh, the, the incident, the slap. But mm. what was the highest rated moment of the night? The highest rated moment was when <laughs> Troy Kosser won Best Supporting Actor, and as the first deaf man to win an Oscar, gave an incredible speech. It was heartfelt, it was funny, it's bittersweet, because um, I've been getting a lot of love. A lot of people saying, man, I haven't watched the Oscars in years, and I really enjoyed it. It was a show that uh, moved and exciting, and there was so much inclusivity on the show. You had all these moments that are, are overshadowed now. So that's the bittersweet part of it because I feel like it was a heck of a show and had some amazingly historical moments that uh, I feel will be forgotten.
We have to remember, they had a good thing going and a new, a, a vibrant uh, show going. So that's unfortunate. And he wanted to make another point. There has been a debate out there. Uh, some are saying and even calling Will Smith some type of a hero for protecting his wife, who was uh, the subject of an insult. And that debate has been going on. And Will Packer wanted to make sure he said, look, yes, we can make an argument that black women in this country absolutely have not gotten the protection they need, should be protected more. But at the same time, we can agree that is not the way to protect protection. them. That is not the way to do it. What concrete in the room? That was a strong statement. Yeah. He said it was done. He couldn't get the energy back. After Wrong that. word. Yeah. Great interview. Great, great interview, PJ. Okay. Well, hey there. All right. So that's the uh, interview. Uh, excellent interview. Wish you had done it on Roland Martin and Filter, which is uh, African American owned and operated. But you know, he did it on Good Morning America. They're they're all right. They have a pretty good reach, I guess. Uh, so ABC, they're 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 pretty okay. Uh, let's go to the phone lines. After this, we're, we're going to go to the uh, segment from Roland Martin Unfiltered from Friday when I was on. And we talked about uh, Will Smith resigning from the Academy. And we also talked about the Will Packer interview. Let's go to the phone lines. I think this is Richard Line 1. Richard, thanks for holding. Welcome to the African History Network show. Tell us where you're calling from. Michael, let's take a commercial break. Okay. All right. Well, we're up against a commercial break. Okay. Calling numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the calling number if you have a question or comment. Listen to the African History Network show right here on 9 10 a.m. Superstation and Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Abundant Capital Group is a real estate investment company with over 20 years of experience in real estate. They specialize in two areas of real estate. One, they solve real estate problems with creative financing solutions that give the seller the most money for their property. And two, they show individuals how to get a higher rate of return on their investment capital with real estate note investing. If you are looking to sell or need to sell your property, here is what they provide. Market value offer, even if you have little or no equity, they typically pay all closing costs, which can be thousands of dollars. They close on a date of the seller's choosing, and the seller does not have to be out of the house at the time of closing. They take the property in an as-is condition, and the seller is not required to make any repairs. Give them a call or email them today for a free consultation and see how they can help you with your real estate needs. Call them at 973-475-8488. That's 973-475-8488. Visit their website, AbundantCapitalGroup.com. That's AbundantCapitalGroup.com. And email them at ACG at AbundantCapitalGroup.com. Follow them on Instagram and Facebook at Abundant Capital Group iRedify is a black-owned digital platform that showcases black and brown cultures and people. The books on the platform are written by African-American authors, Afro-Caribbean authors, African authors, and so much more. Kids 14 and under can read eBooks, listen to audiobooks, and complete learning activities. Kids can even write in the books digitally Get unlimited access to everything on the platform for only $8.99 a month at iRedify.com. Sign up for your membership today. 910 AM Superstation, a division of Adele Media. The views and opinions expressed on any program are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of 910 AM Superstation or Adele Media. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the future radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. All right. It's Sunday, April 3rd, 2022. Uh, let's go to the phone lines. Let's go to Richard. I think we have Richard line one. Richard, welcome to the African History Network show. Thanks for holding. Tell us where you're calling from. Who, who do we have on line one? We Hello. have Mr. Young. Mr. Young. Okay, Mr. Young, welcome to the African History Network show. Thanks for holding. Tell us where you're calling from. Oh, how you doing? I'm calling from Denver, Colorado. Denver, Colorado. Okay. 
go ahead with your question or comment. Thanks for holding. Okay, so first I got uh first I first I wanna say if well, it's not permitted in our society to return physical pain or emotional pain. We all know that everybody knows he was wrong for what he did for slapping somebody for a joke. However, if you were walking down the streets of Detroit and you saw to a couple walking down the street, and then you saw one man come up, point his finger at the woman, make a joke, and then he got slapped. What would, you, what would your reaction be? Oh no, you should sue him for two million dollars. Or would your reaction be? He probably had some coming coming to him. He probably said something out of pocket. So at that point, you know, what I mean, he's risking his reputation and his faith. So I'm not excusing what we've done, but I'm just asking you, isn't this common? Don't you think that people are really getting caught up too much in the glitz and glamour of everything to look no, at it? No, you do you do you do people you, behave. No, you're not getting caught up in the glitz and glamour. You're dealing with two African American men that have been through traumatic experiences and have been through therapy for these traumatic experiences. The next clip I'm going to deals with that when black trauma meets black trauma. This is this is a situation where uh, Will Smith walks up on stage and slaps Chris Rock. And, and nobody's talking about, Chris Rock is not talking about suing Will Smith either. So, okay, but thanks, thanks for calling. Keep listening, uh, Mr. Young, keep listening. Okay, I wanna go to this next clip. I just sent you this clip, uh, uh, Jalen. So uh, I saw this on, um, uh, Facebook, and this is for a segment from DL Hughley's show. Um, and he talked about when black trauma meets black trauma. I want you to hear this. Let's go to uh, clip four, Jalen. Hello, Cool J, round the way, girl. One of the things I would say in response to people who are saying, who are saying to move on, um, it's interesting that you would say this story is old, we should move on. You don't have to be here. It's like complaining about the food at a buffet. If you don't like a meal, move on to something else. But this is kind of, and the reason why stories continue is because people are interested in them. And, and not to belabor the point, but I think there's some very important things to be gleaned from this. What happened Saturday was a clear example of what happens when a black man's trauma meets another black man's trauma. At the same time. Now, of course, I, I said this yesterday, uh, the nation has been mesmerized and interested in and, and, and overanalyzing what has happened to lead Will to this point. It was so out of character for him. So out of character for him. He, you know, he would never act like that for 30 years. And I agree. I've known Will a long time. I was one for a long time. I've seen him grow and expand. So we were wondering what happened when a man who was so put together, a man who has it all, a man who was having the best night of his life, uh, professionally. Uh, why would he snap like that? But on the other side of that is a man in Chris Rock, an, an A-list guy, a guy who was one of the finest comics who have ever lived. Um, but we don't know his story. Like Chris Rock was a dude who was beat up every day, every day. Like I won't say every day because that's a hyperbolic, but often he found himself on the ends of somebody who didn't like him for whatever reason and beat him up. One of those ass whoopings resulted in him being in the hospital for a couple of weeks. Uh, also, when he was on uh, uh, he was on uh, Saturday Night Live, he was beaten and robbed. So the fear of being physically accosted has been so entrenched in him that he had to seek treatment for it. He shot, like many of us have to, for whatever traumas are in our life, or should, whatever the many traumas are in our life. He had to seek help, like mental uh, mental counseling. Somebody had to help him work through it. And one of the things that happened in the process of them helping him work through this trauma is the idea that it may not happen again. But it did in front of the world. Because Will's trauma met Chris Rock's trauma. Let's suffice to say that whether people like to believe this or not, unfortunately, black men and black people, period, but black men in particular, have all been damaged in some way. And it is bad when my damage meets your damage. When my damage meets your damage, it doesn't matter if the world is watching. When my damage 
means your damage. It doesn't matter if there are cameras everywhere. Well, my damage means your damage. It is a bad thing. And we must assume this. There is uh, a story. There was a DC-9. It was an airplane. It was a Marvel engineer. This DC-9 was constructed, and it had a, a plane crash. I'm not sure if it was in Ohio or Washington. But what they found when they deconstructed this DC-9 was there was a grain of sand that was embedded in the match. It was a manufacturing flaw. It was embedded in the rotor of the uh, 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 of the uh, plane. It was embedded, embedded in the rotor. So the plane would take off. And land, take off, and land, take off, and land, and it, there would never be a problem. But the whole time, that grain of sand, that manufacturing flaw, was rupturing that river. It was splitting it. It was opening it up. One day, the plan takes off, and for no explained re- uh, uh, reason, the rupture shifts in half, cuts the hydraulics, the plane crashes. That is black damage. And that is what happens when black trauma meets black trauma. It doesn't matter if you're in the air. It doesn't matter if you're at the office. It doesn't matter if you're in the alley. It doesn't matter if you're in the school. That is what happens. And what that requires is us for all to, all of us to understand that we are all damaged in some way. That in some way, despite our best intentions, there is a flaw in our manufacturing. And what that requires us to have is a certain amount of grace. It is not that you let people run over you. It is not that you let people destroy you. But you understand that they have a grain of sand in, your, in their rotor just like you do. That just like you do. That there was a flaw in their manufacturing just like yours. And maybe that will help us understand. When trauma meets trauma, when black trauma meets black trauma, it doesn't matter what else is around. And what that requires from us to understand whether it's me and Kanye or Will and, 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 and Chris or this dude and that dude, it requires us, us understanding that all of us, all of us, have some grain of sand in our rotors that one day will rupture. One day, for one, whatever explained reason. And that requires us understanding that all of us are entitled to a little bit of grace from one to another. Now, I'm not no Bible sucker. I'm not going to tell you that I'm going to change tomorrow. But I will try to do my best to understand that all of us, have a little sand in our rotor that can rupture at any time, and that definitely requires grace. That's a little note from the GED section. Got the jazz report right. coming in 15 minutes. Pause it right there. The Pause it right there. All right. On another. All right. Okay. So that was D.L. Hughley talking about when black trauma meets black trauma. <laughs> and that's what we saw displayed. And, and this is something I've talked about on Roller Martin Unfiltered because it's like these are two wealthy African American men. They've won awards, been in movies, all this. And they're both victims of trauma. They're both victims of trauma. Okay, um, we're going to clip three, uh, Jalen, uh, from Roland Martin Unfiltered. So uh, I'm a panelist uh, usually each Friday on Roland Martin Unfiltered. We were already scheduled to talk about the uh, the Will Packard interview. Uh, on Good Morning America, we were already scheduled to talk about that. And before we could even get to that segment, the the news story broke that um, Will Smith was resigning from uh, the uh, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. And Variety.com has this story here. We posted this story on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. I think it's gotten over two thousand likes. Will Smith resigns from Academy over Chris Rock uh Oscar slap backlash okay let's go uh let's go to clip 3 uh Jalen okay clip clip 3 from Roland Martin unfiltered 1311. All right, folks, uh, some breaking news here. Uh, just in, uh, Will Smith uh, has resigned from the Academy of Motion Picture, Picture Arts and Sciences uh, as a result of uh, him slapping Chris Rock uh, Sunday uh, at the uh, Academy Awards. Of course, uh, the Academy, uh, they have uh, launched an investigation, uh, and as a result, uh, they've done this. This is a statement uh, that Will Smith uh, has uh, released um, um, as a result of this. Uh, give me a second. I'm just going to go ahead and try to see if I can uh, share this screen. Just give me one second, folks. 
I want to show you this. Uh, this is, I'm reading from a story uh, in Variety as they talk about, uh, as they have the Will Smith uh, story here. Um, he says, uh, the list of those I have hurt it is long and includes Chris, his family, many of my dear friends and loved ones, all those in attendance and global audiences at home. I betrayed the trust of the Academy. I deprived other nominees and winners of their opportunity to celebrate and be celebrated for their extraordinary work. I am heartbroken. That is the, uh, and then it says, uh, Smith also acknowledged that his actions overshadowed other winners of the, uh, at the 94th Annual Academy Awards. Uh, I want to put the focus back on those who deserve attention for their achievements and allow the Academy to get back to the incredible work it does to support creativity and artistry in film. Uh, it's included, uh, he stated concluding with change, change takes time. I'm committed to doing the work to ensure I never again allow violence to overtake reason. Uh, now today uh, on Good Morning America, an exclusive interview with TJ Holmes, our Oscar producer Will Packer uh, sat down uh, and um, shared his thoughts on what happened uh, on Sunday night. Uh, here is some right. of what he said. Pa pause right there, Jalen. I said, why? Pa Pause, pause right there because we we are recovered that. Okay, so um, Jalen, do me a favor, cue that up at the. Let me see where is. Cue that up at the uh, one hour twenty two sec. One hour twenty two minute mark. Cue it up there. Just fast forward to one hour twenty two minutes. Uh, hold on, let me see now. Uh, one hour 29 minutes fast forward to one hour 29 minutes okay we'll pick it up there on the other side of the break uh if we look at the statement from uh will smith resigning from the academy okay he said this is uh he said the list of those i have heard is long and includes chris his family many of my dear friends and loved ones all in attendance um and global audiences at home and global audiences at home. He goes on to say, uh, I betrayed the trust of the Academy. I deprived other nominees and winners of their opportunity to celebrate and be celebrated for their extraordinary work. I am heartbroken. Uh, he continued, I want to put the focus back on those who deserve attention for their achievements and allow the Academy to get back to the incredible work it does to support creativity and artistry and film. Um, he concluded change takes time and I am committed to doing the work to ensure that I never again allow violence to overtake reason, end quote. Uh, so when we come back from the break, I'll share the other segment from Roland Martin and Filtered where we talked about this. Then I want you to hear from Chris Rock, he was talking to Angela Yee about being diagnosed with nonverbal learning disorder. Listen to the African History Network show on Michael M. Hotel. Uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. Follow the story Skeeter Hawk as attorney Ben Brooks rediscovers his Gullah Geechee heritage and finds romance along the Gullah Trail and the Sea Islands. Jilted by his fiance who refused to marry him, Ben Brooks goes back home to Gullah country. There, the Gullah people come to call him Skeeter Hawk. While rediscovering his heritage, Skeeter Hawk unravels dark family secrets. A beautiful childhood friend, Fulla, becomes his guide as they travel the Gullah Trail from North Carolina to the Sea Islands in South Carolina in search of more answers. Ben Brooks falls in love with her and becomes torn between her and his former fiance who wants to rekindle their romance. He also deals with a premonition that one of his enemies is pursuing him, providing a backdrop for mystery, romance, intrigue, and suspense in this page-turning novel called Skeeter Hawk from author Sabby Stone. Order your copy today at SavvyStone.com. That's S-A-V-Y, SavvyStone.com. What does self-care mean to you? 
to us, it's an opportunity to reconnect with nature. A chance to create something remarkable. At Sage and Elm Apothecary, our handcrafted skin care and household products immerse you in Earth's sweetest nectar, connecting you to nature in a way you never imagined. See for yourself and visit us at sageandelmapothecary.com. Welcome back to the African History Network show. All right. Uh, be sure to register for the online classes I teach uh, on the weekends. And now, um, actually, we have nine weeks of the uh, classes archived. So as soon as you register, you can start watching the class. You don't have to be in class at a certain time. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Okay. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips, classes on sale, $60, regularly $130. We have a bundle pack where you can register for both classes that I teach. The second class is from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. We have a bundle pack. You can register for both classes for a hundred dollars. Okay. Uh, even after the course is over with a year from now, two years from now, you can still watch the entire course. You'll still have access to it. If you've taken any of my classes in the past, email me at AHN show at African history network.com AHN show at African history network.com. And, uh, you'll get a 50% discount on, on the bundle pack. All right. And then also the power in one conference, is coming up uh in detroit uh this is at the double tree hotel in downtown detroit uh the power in one conference you're going to have uh one of my two of my teachers dr leonard jeffries and professor jane small you have dr malefe keti asante uh, uh dr chike akua uh this is from uh happy films happy presents one africa power and unity conference you know uh last year i think it was september last year we screened the, the film Hapi, the role of economics and development of civilization. We screened that here in Detroit and Taiki was here and Sister Felicia, uh, they're the producers of the film. So this is Saturday, April 30th, 2022, Sunday, May 1st, 2022. You can join us in person or you can live stream from around the world. You can live stream from around the world. One Africa Power and Unity two-day conference in Detroit. I'll be there also. I'll have a vendor booth there. I may be speaking, not sure yet. Uh, so we're going to post a link here so you can register and we'll have the information at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com as well. Okay. So, uh, I want to go back to, uh, we're going to go to that second, the other clip from, uh, Roland Martin unfiltered, uh, Jalen. So we talked about what happened and we, we talked about the, the, um, breaking news story also of uh will smith resigning from the uh, uh academy of motion pictures arts and sciences all right let's go to this clip uh Jaylen. i think these people saw the person that they know and were hoping that somehow some way this was an aberration he's going to stand on stage and maybe chris rock comes from the back and says ah we got you all you know um i i, I don't think that these were people that were applauding anything at all about that moment and all these people saw their friend at his absolute worst moment and were hoping that they could encourage him and lift him up and that he would somehow try to make it better uh i mean this is <sighs> Today is Friday. Today is Friday. Hey, Kelly, what I said on Monday, what I said on Monday, I said, I hope Will meets with Chris face to face on Tuesday, by Tuesday, to personally apologize. I said, otherwise, I know what's about to happen. This is going to be a constant media firestorm. 
The thing that I am always trying to tell people, it's like, yo, I've been in this news business my entire life. And every action, everything that happens, if another thing happens, it's another news cycle. Mm -hmm. And so Monday's news cycle was, was the slap. Tuesday's news cycle was the apology. Wednesday's news cycle was the academy saying they asked him to leave, we knew they were lying. <clears throat> then we saw the other stories, and then Thursday, so now here we are Friday, and now there's the investigation, and then now the members of the academy are hot because apparently on Tuesday, there was a six minute Zoom between Will and the president and the CEO of the academy or the chair, and they didn't tell anybody, it's back and forth. And, uh, Again, this is this is the thing that Chris has his show in Boston. He speaks about a minute on the whole deal. Uh, it, it it goes on, and people keep saying, like, as a matter of fact, I, 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 that was a um, um, that was a tweet from Quest Love where he was like, "Can we end this? It ain't going in. It's not, I mean, it's 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 not going to end until literally they finish their investigation and you have." Uh, some resolution, if you will, uh, to what's going on. Kelly, go ahead. Like Questlove, I am tired of talking about this situation, but it is in the news cycle, so we're going to do it. Um, this entire situation is just unfortunate, um, but most importantly, not even because Will Smith slap Chris Rock, but this might have been one of, if not the most Black-oriented Oscar ceremony we've ever had in its 94-year history, and no one's going to remember anything except these two Black men acting a fool on stage. Really, one Black man acting a fool on stage, and another Black man receiving said foolery. That is the most unfortunate part about all of it. It is sad, and it is disgrace disgraceful in that regard. And I don't mean disgraceful in the sense that, you know, oh, it made Black people look bad. I'm not into the respectability politics of it all. I'm really into the fact that this one moment stole so many other amazing moments that night. Regina Hall and Wanda Sykes on the same stage doing what they do best. No one's going to remember that. Quest Love winning an Oscar for his documentary that, by all accounts, is absolutely phenomenal. No one's going to remember that. The first uh, openly queer Afro-Latina won an Oscar that night. No one even knows that. All we are talking about is Will Smith and Chris Rock. And it is, it is infuriating to me that so many people's moments were stolen because of one man's stupidity. That is just so unfortunate to me, and just wrong. Um, this is the tweet uh, that Questlove sent out uh, this morning. This morning, can we finally stop talking about it? it here's the deal. The mm -hmm. reality, Michael, is that people are not. And this is, th this is the thing that I, I, I kept trying to explain to people. I mean... The level of energy when you're talking about two of the biggest names in entertainment. I mean, right. Chris Rock is literally embark embarking on a world tour with Kevin Hart. Mm -hmm. Two comic legends, the two biggest in comedy right now, on a tour together around the world, sold out shows around the world. Then you have the biggest movie star. Folks, listen to me. The acting chops of Denzel, phenomenal. Denzel cannot touch the box office and mass appeal of Will Smith. Rapper, TV show, big screen star. Will's got stuff on National Geographic. He's doing stuff with YouTube, all of that. Those forces collide on a show that is seen in 100 plus countries worldwide. Mm -hmm. Folks are gonna keep talking about it. And then 
every action. Again, the apology, story. Academy investigation, story. Right. Will's interview, story. Will Packer's interview, story. His resignation, story. Jada's tweet about healing, story. It is the nature of where we are. It's a, it's a huge story, Roland. It's a tragedy. I started covering this Monday night on the African History Network show. I didn't deal with the Tuesday. I dealt with the Wednesday and Thursday. Um, we know that a formal review was launched by the Academy on Monday. Um, I think, we, you know, Will Smith, uh, there, was a re there was a report from either New York Daily News or New York Post. I've read so many articles that said that Will Smith has been on edge the past few months because of stories in the media about he and Jada's relationship. Okay. Okay. Pause, pause it right there. Uh, we're going to pick this up on the other side of the break. And uh, we always come up on the commercial when I'm talking. Uh, we'll pick this up on the other side of the break. Uh, you listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the future radio. We're also going to talk about the House of Representatives on Friday, uh, April 1st, passed a bill to legalize marijuana, decriminalize marijuana. We're going to talk about what this means and why was marijuana made illegal in 1937 in the first place. As long as white people were using it, there was no problem. When African-Americans start using it and Latinos and, and other people, now all of a sudden it's a problem. Listen to the African History Network show. We'll be back in a few minutes. Abundant Capital Group is a real estate investment company with over 20 years of experience in real estate. They specialize in two areas of real estate. One, they solve real estate problems with creative financing solutions that give the seller the most money for their property. And two, they show individuals how to get a higher rate of return on their investment capital with real estate note investing. If you are looking to sell or need to sell your property, here is what they provide. Market value offer, even if you have little or no equity, they typically pay all closing, costs which can be thousands of dollars they close on a date of the seller's choosing and the seller does not have to be out of the house at the time of closing they take the property in an as-is condition and the seller is not required to make any repairs give them a call or email them today for a free consultation and see how they can help you with your real estate needs Call them at 973-475-8488. That's 973-475-8488. Visit their website, AbundantCapitalGroup.com. That's AbundantCapitalGroup.com. And email them at ACG at AbundantCapitalGroup.com. Follow them on Instagram and Facebook at Abundant Capital Group. Mental health and well-being have long been a taboo subject in the so-called African-American community. So I enlisted the help of mental health experts, thought leaders, and activists to help kill the ghost of Willie Lynch and heal from post-traumatic slave syndrome. We experience trauma a lot of times um, on a subconscious level. So sometimes something happens to us and we know that it's traumatizing, but we don't really recognize the extent of the trauma. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on that name, the Superstation, the Future Radio. Okay, uh, I want to go back to this segment here from uh, Roland Martin Unfiltered. And I was actually speaking, I was on the uh, panel, and we were talking about um, the, uh, the Will Packer interview on Good Morning America, and then also the, the news of uh, Will Smith resigning from the Academy. Let's go back to this clip, Jalen. And with, um, you know, I was I, I watched it. Um, I, I watched Will's acceptance speech live when I got finished doing my show Sunday night. I watched it live and I was hoping that he would apologize to Chris Rock in the acceptance speech. And he did not. And I was uh, and um, even though he put out an apology on I think it was either Monday or Tuesday, he put out an apology on Instagram. Um, he has not talked to Chris Rock in person or over the phone or something like that to apologize. So um, it was a fantastic interview that Will Packer did this morning. It helped to, I think, clear up some misinformation that's been floating around on social media. 
Uh, I wish he had uh, done the interview here on Roland Martin Unfiltered, but he did it on Good Morning America. Uh, also, in that interview, I didn't hear anything in that interview that said the Academy lied either. You know, there's so there's um, there's there, there, from, from the reporting that I, that I've read, and I've read numerous articles on this. There was one group of leaders in the Academy that wanted Will Smith to lead leave. There was another group that didn't want him to leave, and they're arguing back and forth, and they're arguing with Will's representatives also. So, you know, uh, this is um, really an example of how even at even someone who has what many people think they want to have the the wealth, the uh, the Academy Award, the success, <laughs> more money, more problems. <clears throat> Yeah. You still got problems. Oh, well, it's, so. and it's that, and just and yeah, and that's the thing that people don't quite un don't understand, don't get. Um, you know, the, the the thing here. Give me give me a second, because uh, I actually um, found the actual full statement. Um, uh, what he said was that uh, just don't do not pull it up, please. Uh, I'm trying to remove this um, this uh, email from the top. So just hold on. Okay, there we go. Um, here we go here. Uh, first of all, he said, I have directly responded to the Academy's disciplinary hearing notice, and I will fully accept any and all consequences for my conduct. My actions at the 94th Academy Awards presentation were shocking, painful, and inexcusable. And then that's when he goes on to say, uh, the list of uh, those I've hurt is long and, inc and, and includes Chris, his family, many of my dear friends and loved ones all those in attendance and in global audiences at home. I betrayed the trust of the Academy. I deprived other nominees and winners of their opportunity to celebrate. Right there. Okay, we covered all that. All right, so uh, so that's what that's an uh, excerpt of what happened on uh, Friday's show uh, when I was on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Uh, download the Black Star Media app. You can watch Roland Martin Unfiltered there. Also follow Roland on Facebook and YouTube um, as well, and you can watch it there also. Okay, I, I want to go to um, this. Uh, we're going to clip uh, the, the the clip of Chris Rock, uh, Jalen. So uh, I follow Angela Yee from the Breakfast Club. I follow her on um, Twitter. No, uh, Facebook. I follow her on Facebook. And there was uh, this uh, excerpt of an interview that the Breakfast Club did with. Chris Rock. Now, this happened before the Oscars. I'm not exactly sure when, but it happened before. It's from 2022. It happened before the Oscars. And Chris Rock is talking about dealing with nonverbal learning disorder, nonverbal learning disorder. OK, let's go to this clip, Jalen. You Hello? said that you had been diagnosed with this nonverbal uh, learning disorder. So. How does that affect your everyday life, and what can you do about it? Um, how does it affect my everyday life? I process things slower. I'm like, I don't pick up on the hints. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, I process it. I, it, you, I, I, okay. One for me is I have a hard time with social cues. So when we talk, all I hear is, all I pick up are the words. Mm -hmm. So if you were angry with me or just perturbed with me, or even if you were into me and you were like, like trying to, you know, whatever, have sex or whatever, I, like I wouldn't pick up on it. You'd have to literally say it to me. You know what I mean? I would pick up on it like a week later. Like, hey, I think <laughs> it. What happened? Okay. It was really into me. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, that's how my mind works. I have a hard time. I'm one of these guys. I can't do anything technical. Like, all this, like, I can't. Yeah, so I, somebody had to put up the volume, turn down the volume for you. We would like to. Yeah, yeah. Like, it just takes me a minute. But, and I used to not realize, I used to just think I was old or I was slow. But now I'm realizing, oh, okay. And I'm getting better. Like I can, I can work my Bluetooth now. I can. You know what I mean? How did I you realize? Work. When did you realize what it was, or or, or, or 
what the problem was. You know, it's weird. A friend of mine jokingly, like, said I had Asperger's. And I was like, really? He said, I think you might have Asperger's. And it's weird. Just said to myself, okay, I'm going to get tested. Because I had a I had another relative with Asperger's, right? Mm -hmm. And I got tested, and the doctor was like, no, you don't have Asperger's, but what you have is right next to it. Mm -hmm. And it's called NGLD. And the doctor was like, you know, you've been taken advantage of in life. You're, you're a little slow in some instances, and you're hyped, and you're amazing, but on, at the same time, you have your verbal ability and your your memory are impeccable. Right. So I've been, you know, it's like the blind guy that can hear amazingly. You know what I mean? Like right. I've been overcompensating right. for it. And, you know, like not, okay, having a hard time with subtlety is great on a stand-up stage where you're screaming. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But in a one-on-one -on -one yeah. relationship, Ah, you know, my relationship with my brothers, my relationship with my mother, or, you know, wife, girlfriend, like, all of that's like, mm, this is all suffered because I'm like, I have a hard time picking up stuff. But now that I know, mm -hmm. I'm a thousand times better. All right. So what? that's a, that's a really interesting uh uh, interview. I, I didn't know he he had a nonverbal learning disorder. Uh, it it explains certain things, but I didn't know he suffered from that. He, he, okay, those on Facebook and YouTube for some reason restream or Facebook or somebody stopped broadcasting, so we're back. Okay, this is part two. Um, but that clip that we just played, that interview uh, with Chris Rock and him talking about having nonverbal learning disorder. That just goes to show, you know, you, you see somebody who's a multimillionaire, they're in movies, they've been on Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live. You think they have, you know, everything that you want, what have you, and they have, they have a lot of things that you don't want, okay, also. So uh, that, was, that was a good interview, though. All right, I want to go to uh, this next story here. And this is dealing with the bill that passed the House of Representatives. OK, we're going to the clip from MSNBC, uh, Jalen. The House of Representatives on uh, Friday, April 1st, passed a bill to legalize uh, marijuana. OK, they passed a bill to legalize marijuana. All right. And Jill. Hey, Jill, I just got you just got your uh, donation through Cash App. Thanks so much, Jill. We definitely appreciate that. OK, um, and you can support us through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App or through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. This helps us keep we're here six days a week. And even I'm here on I do radio here on 910. I don't get paid to do radio. They don't pay me to do radio. OK. So this helps. It costs money to be able to finance all this stuff and keep doing the research and everything, pay for all these services, et cetera. So we definitely appreciate that. Um, and then we have the information at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com also. So the House of Representatives on Friday passed this bill to um, uh, legalize uh, marijuana, all right? And we're going to deal with this on the other side of break because we take <laughs> breaks every 15 minutes here and it, it kills me. Uh, <laughs> we'll deal with this on the other side of break. We'll, we'll talk about what this means and why was marijuana made illegal in 1937? As long as white people were using it, it was not a problem. The problem came when African-Americans started using it and jazz singers and things like this started using it and the rumors that were circulating around. Listen to the African History Network show. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the future radio. OK, uh, I want to go to this story here. This happened. Now, we were this was a story we were supposed to talk about Friday on Roland Martin Unfiltered. 
uh, the House of Representatives passed the bill to decriminalize marijuana. We ran out of time and did not get a chance uh, to get to uh, that story. And that was a story I really want to talk about, actually. So I said, this, since this is my show, I said, we'll talk about it here. We'll probably talk about this some more Monday uh, since we're running out of time as well. Washington Post has a good story. We're going to clip seven in just a second, Jalen, from MSNBC. House passes bill decriminalizing marijuana. Senate fortunes unclear. Senate fortunes unclear. It's not clear what's going to happen in the Senate because you need 60 votes to get this bill passed in the Senate. So the House of Representatives on Friday passed legislation that would remove marijuana from the federal schedule of controlled substances, a move that comes as an increasing number of states have passed uh, decriminal decriminalization laws. The measure, which is H.R. 3617, is known as the Marijuana Opportunity Reinvestment and Expungement Act, the Marijuana Opportunity Reinvestment and Expungement Act or MORE, or the MORE Act, M-O-R-E. The House passed similar legislation in December 2020, but it was brought up for, but it was not brought up for a vote in the Senate, which was controlled by Republicans at the time in December 2020. Now, Friday's vote was 220 to 204, okay? Only three Republicans voted for the bill, and two Democrats voted against the bill. So it was overwhelmingly supported by Democrats. It remains unclear whether the law, whether the late, the latest measure will receive a vote in the Senate. The White House has not yet issued statement on whether President Joe Biden supports the legislation. A group of Senate Democrats, including Senate Majority Leader Charles E. Schumer, Chuck Schumer of New York, and Senators Cory Booker, New Jersey, and Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon are expected to release draft uh, to release draft marijuana legislation later this month. In a statement Friday afternoon, Senator Chuck Schumer applauded the uh, passage of the Moore Act, noting his own support for decriminal decriminalization and declaring uh, that quote the time has come for comprehensive reform of federal cannabis laws. He added that he, Senator Cory Booker and Senator Ron Wyden plan to introduce their legislation very soon. Okay. Uh, I want to go to this clip here from uh, MSNBC. Uh, this is Katie Turr talking about this bill passing on Friday. Let's go to this clip, Jalen. So my father-in-law, the United States House of Representatives, just voted to legalize marijuana across the country. The MORE Act would remove pot from the list of controlled substances and would be applied retroactively to any and all individuals who faced criminal penalties for manufacturing, distributing, or possessing marijuana, i.e. my father-in-law. It was passed with a bipartisan 220 to 204 vote. Now, Democrats in the Senate are finalizing the text of their version of the bill with the goal to release it this month, though not necessarily by, oh gosh, 420. I didn't even write that. I apologize. Joining me now is NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent, Leanne Caldwell. Um, so not to make this about me, I know that a lot of people have experiences around the country, but my father-in-law was convicted of distributing quite a bit of pot, um, $10 million worth, frankly. Uh, here's his mugshot back in uh, the 80s, and he spent some time in jail. Tell me about what this would mean, not necessarily for him, but for people who have convictions um, having to do with possession or debt distribution. I know it's ruined a lot of lives. It sure has, Katie. And this is a big deal. What it's doing is the federal bank is really catching up with a lot of states, 38 States plus the District of Columbia have already legalized marijuana. 18 states in the District of Columbia allow it for medical use. But in addition to decriminalizing it, one of the big things this bill does is it expunges people's record who have been convicted of marijuana-related crimes. In the history of, it doesn't matter how long ago those convictions took place, 10, 20, 30 years ago, and so this is an attempt, Democrats say, to level the playing field and really 
get rid of the criminalization that, like you said, has ruined so many people's lives. Now, the vote outcome, just three Republicans voted or support, uh, uh, voted for it, joining all but two Democrats. So this is still a very partisan issue, apparently. And yes, it then goes to the Senate next. Katie? It's a partisan issue in Congress, but it is it, the majority of Americans want it to be decriminalized. Um, when it goes to the Senate, Leanne, what is the likelihood that, that it will get a majority? Are, are all Democrats on board in the Senate for this, even? Uh, it's too early to tell at this point. This is going to be overwhelmingly popular for Democrats. Of course, it needs the support of 10 Republicans, but they don't have legislative text yet. Yes, they want to have something released by 420, but I don't know if that's the case. They haven't finished legislate or writing the bill yet. Uh, they say it's going to be much more expan- or a bit more expansive than the House bill. We're not sure how exactly, um, but the pro- Prospects are better this year than they have been in the history of this country to finalize, to finally decriminalize uh, this, uh, no, no, that it's no longer a controlled substance, Katie. All right, pause it right there. Okay, so if we go back to this article from the Washington Post very quickly here, um, in addition to eliminating criminal penalties for the manufacturer distribution distribution or possession of marijuana, the MORE Act would provide for the regulation and taxation of legal cannabis sales. It would also provide for the expungement of federal marijuana convictions dating to 1971 and and bar the denial of federal public benefits or security clearances on the basis of marijuana offenses. This is huge. You're talking about wiping off criminal convictions, federal criminal federal criminal convictions from people's records that's barring them from getting certain types of certain types of jobs, et cetera, housing in certain certain instances, et cetera. OK, now, if we go further down in the article, um, they talk about remarks from Representative Barbara Lee uh, and we know Matt Gates voted for this. Only three Republicans voted for this bill. Um, Okay, represent, uh, remarks from Representative Barbara Lee, a uh, Democrat from California, member of the Congressional Black Caucus. She argued that the legislation would help repair the damage done by the war on drugs and the country's, quote, failed policy of marijuana prohibition, which has led to the shattering of so many lives, primarily black men, b- black and brown people, end quote. Uh, she said, make no mistake. Yes, it is a racial justice bill. Yes, it is a racial justice bill. She went on to say, according to the ACLU, American Liberties Union, uh, black America nearly four times more likely to be arrested for cannabis and related crimes than white Americans, despite equal rates of use. These arrests uh, can have a detrimental impact on a person's quality of life and can lead to difficulty finding employment, securing housing and assessing other benefits. Okay. Those watching on Facebook and YouTube, keep watching. This is a huge bill. We have to get this passed through the Senate. This is, this will be transformative for many people and their families. You're talking about decriminalizing marijuana. You're talking about expunging people's criminal records. All right. And, and African Americans have disproportionately been been impacted by marijuana being criminalized. Those watching on Facebook and YouTube, keep watching for a few more minutes. The African History Network on Facebook and Michael M. Hotep on YouTube. We're going to keep going, and we're going to deal with the man who's largely responsible for marijuana being made illegal in 1937. Remember, right now is correct. Wrong behavior is not over till we win. Wakanda forever. We'll talk to you uh, tomorrow. Peace. Okay, stand by. All right, let's continue here. Okay, this article from the Washington Post. We'll go for a few more minutes here. Uh, Then we're gonna wrap up. Okay, so uh, this is Representative Barbara Lee. Uh, These arrests can have a detrimental impact on a person's quality of life and can lead to Difficulty finding employment, securing housing, and accessing other benefits. Now, Representative Jerry Nadler, Gerald Nadler, 
the legis the legis a Democrat of New York, the legislation's major sponsor, said his bill quote would set a a new path forward, and would begin to correct some of the injustices of the last fifty years. And I I totally agree with this bill. Now I don't use marijuana. Never used marijuana in my life. I don't advocate recreational usage of marijuana, but marijuana should not be criminalized at all. And, and it was for racist reasons that it was criminalized in the first place. Jerry Nadler said, whatever one's views are on the use of marijuana for recreational or medicinal use, and I do acknowledge their medicinal purposes for it. Usually they'll consume it, put it in the food. They won't smoke it normally for medicinal purposes because it, it burns smoking it reduces the amount of thc that you take into your system because you're burning it usually people will put it in food whatever one's views are on the use of marijuana for recreational or medicinal medicinal use the policy of arrest prosecution and incarceration at the federal level has proven both unwise and unjust has proven both unwise and unjust now what's interesting here is the the response from republicans on this bill okay because here you have democrats trying to place a bill to reduce the number of people being criminalized and arrested and locked up taken away from their families and to expunge people's records to give them a new lease on life. Republicans countered this bill by dismissing the legislation, dismissing the legislation as a waste of time. Republicans countered the bill by dismissing the legislation as a waste of time, arguing that Democrats should, arguing that Democrats should instead be addressing other issues such as inflation crime and gas prices well wait a second notice how when it comes to issues that we advocate for and issues that disproportionately affect the african-american community issues that if these bills pass will have a transformative effect on african-americans notice how republicans want to say Oh, we have other things to we have other things to cover. We we have bigger issues. This is the same argument Republicans made when the Crown Act passed the House of Representatives a couple of weeks ago. And I think it was only 14 Republicans that voted for that bill, the Crown Act. And people like Representative Jim Jordan of Ohio, Republican, said that we have more important issues to deal with. The Crown Act is important. This is important as well. Republicans don't have any answers for inflation. Inflation is global, number one. Inflation is not just happening in the U.S. They don't have any answers for that. They're just trying to they're just trying to shift the focus from the fact that they did not vote for this bill that will disproportionately positively impact African Americans. They're just trying to distract from that. Quote: The let this is who who said this? This is dumbass Jim Jordan. This is here, dumbass Jim Jordan he needs to be voted out of office. This is what this fool said, quote, the left will not let the Democrats do what needs to be done to help the inflation problem, the energy problem, the illegal immigration problem on our southern border. So what do they do? They legalize drugs. Wow. Wow. This is wrong and everybody knows it. Let's focus on the things that matter. Well, you already have 37 states included and, and the district of columbia they have legalized medicinal marijuana you have a number of states that have legalized uh recreational marijuana okay uh and i can't remember how many states i think it's like 14 states that have something like 14 states that have legalized um recreational marijuana uh as well Okay, see, these are the type of idiots that have to be voted out of uh, voted out of Congress. So check out this uh, article here. House passes bill decriminalizing marijuana. Senate fortunes unclear. This is from April 1st, 2022 from the Washington Post. Okay, now, if we look at, I want to go and let's deal with some of the history of why 
marijuana was made illegal okay and if you like this type of information you can support the african history network and support our research dollar sign the ahn show through cash app dollar sign the ahn show through cash app or through paypal paypal.me forward slash the ahn show and if you want to um somebody just emailed me uh they want to uh buy the course the, the uh, our online courses and give them away as gifts you can do that as well email us at uh, uh ahn show at african history network.com ahn show at african history network.com okay uh for that also all right uh, i want to go to this next story here this deals with the history of why marijuana was made illegal and it deals with a white supremacist named harry j anslinger harry j anslinger now there, there have been a number of articles written about harry j anslinger for the sake of time we're going to look at this good one here uh from uh cbs news okay and all right let's look at this here this is from uh november 17th 2016 um and it uh let's see if you look if you look for the roots of america's ban on cannabis you'll find nearly all roads lead to a man named harry j anslinger he was the first commissioner of the federal bureau of narcotics the first commissioner of the federal bureau of narcotics which laid the groundwork for the modern day dea and the first architect the first architect of the war on drugs harry j anslinger was appointed in 1930 uh just just as the prohibition of alcohol was beginning to crumble and prohibition was repealed in 1933 okay uh harry j anslinger was remained in power for 32 years early on he was on record essentially saying cannabis use was no big deal he called the idea that it made people mad or violent an absurd fallacy an absurd fallacy but when harry j anslinger was put in charge of the federal bureau of narcotics he changed his position entirely here's a picture of this white supremacist the reason why marijuana is illegal today is largely due to uh this white supremacist right here because of racist reasons he also lied in his testimony um uh, uh in congress he also lied in his testimony in congress and he said that uh white women uh crave black men sexually when they're high on marijuana all right and i i got a direct quote on that too because when I was re uh, back in 2016, I was doing research for a lecture I was doing dealing with uh, how Richard Nixon's war on drugs was a war in the African-American community. And I started researching the history of U.S. drug laws and why certain drugs were made illegal. And um, uh, I came across the article from New York Times February 8th, 1914, Negro cocaine fiends have turned to sniffing now that uh, uh, whiskey is prohibited or alcohol is prohibited, something like that. There's a famous article from the New York Times, and this deals with why uh, marijuana was made. Well, this deals with why uh, cocaine was made illegal, okay, because cocaine used to be legal also uh but there were um th there were uh rumors and lies being spread that um african-american men had super strength where they when they were high on cocaine if you look at this i um had to get a subscription to the new york times this is why i have a subscription to the new york times uh to this day because i was doing research on this topic and trying to research that article that famous article from february 8th 1914 from the new york times and it's in their archives it's over 100 years old so i had to get a digital subscription uh, to 
uh, be able to access their archives to be able to research this. Um, here's, the, here's the name of the article. Negro cocaine fiends are a new Southern menace. Murder and insanity increasing among lower class blacks because they have taken to sniffing since deprived of whiskey by prohibition. So they're talking about the fear of African-American men using cocaine and being high on cocaine and will they rape white women when they're high on cocaine and they're asking the question uh do do police officers now need to carry a 45 caliber handgun to kill a negro high on cocaine because a 38 is not powerful enough to do this okay these are questions that they're asking in the article and these are questions that were circulating around at that time 1914 this is the year before the movie the birth of a nation comes out and there's a scene in the birth birth of a nation where it depicts an, an african-american man who's really a white man in black face depicts an african-american man trying to rape a white virgin and we know that the ku klux klan are the heroes of the movie and, and that movie rejuvenates the ku klux klan okay the movie the birth of a nation now from the moment he took charge of the bureau harry j anslinger Harry was aware of the weakness of his new position. A, a war on no a war on no narcotics alone, cocaine and heroin outlawed in 1914. Okay, cocaine and heroin outlawed in 1914. Okay, that wasn't enough. Author uh, Johan Hari wrote in his book Chasing the Scream the first and last days of the war on drugs chasing the screen the first and last days of the war on drugs quote they were used only by a tiny minority and you couldn't keep an entire department alive on such small crumbs he noted he need he, uh, he needed more you couldn't keep an entire department alive on such small crumbs Okay, Harry J. Anslinger needed more. Consequently, Harry J. Anslinger made it his mission to rid the U.S. of all drugs, of all drugs, including cannabis. Now, it wasn't originally called marijuana. It was called cannabis or hemp. The reason why they changed the name to marijuana Marijuana is a Spanish term, and you had Mexicans coming into the U.S. across the Mexican border in the early 1900s and in the 1930s, and all the animosity that white people in this country, especially white people in this country, had against Mexicans was associated with the term marijuana, all right? It's also important to note that during this period of time, you also have a deportation campaign that starts in about 1930 with President Herbert Hoover, okay? And this is during the Great Depression. So Herbert Hoover wins the 1928 presidential election. He only serves one term. He mishandles the uh, Great Depression, which is preceded by the stock market crash in 1929, October 1929. Um, he has this campaign called... Um, Real jobs for real Americans. Real jobs for for real Americans, and he's going to he's going to start deporting um, Mexican Americans and Mexicans, and they're deporting them to Mexico, and they're saying that these people are taking jobs away from Americans, basically white Americans, because that's what he was concerned about. These people are taking jobs away from white Americans, um, and this is during the Depression. Is going to continue with President Franklin Roosevelt as well. Now, U.S. is going to deport is going to deport up to 1.8 million Mexicans. Many of them, about 60 percent, it was estimated were born were here legally. Now, this is an article from History.com that I've talked about before. History.com is the official website of the History Channel. The U.S. deported a million owned citizens to Mexico during the Great Depression. 
up to 1.8 million people of Mexican descent, most of them American born, most of them American born, were rounded up in informal raids and deported in an effort to reserve jobs for white people, in an effort to reserve, reserve jobs for white people, okay? And this is in the 1930s. And uh, Herbert Hoover uh, had this uh, campaign, uh, Real Jobs for Real Americans. Okay, what do you call them a real American? That's the first question I would ask you because a lot of this land that the U.S. got, they got from Mexico. So, you know, what do you call them a real American? And let me see, we, we have it in here. American, job, American Jobs for Real Americans, that's what he called it. Although there were no federal law or executive order authorizing the 1930 raids, President Herbert Hoover's administration, which used the racially coded slogan, American jobs for real Americans, implicitly approved them. Okay, read this, read this article here. And this goes back to the animosity between the U.S. and Mexico that leads to the Mexican-American War of 1846-1848. Okay, um, so read that article. All right, now, back to this one here, and then we have to get out of here. So I have a lot of work to do. So consequently, Harry J. Anslinger made it his mission to rid the U.S. of all drugs, including cannabis. His influence played a major role in the introduction and passage of the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937, which outlawed possessing or selling pot or marijuana. Why did this happen? Fueled by a handful of 1920s newspaper stories about crazed or violent episodes after marijuana usage. Harry J. Anslinger first claimed that the drug could cause psychosis and eventually insanity. In a radio ad in a radio address, he stated, young people uh, are, quote, slaves to the narcotic, slaves to, to this narcotic continuing addiction until they deteriorate mentally, uh, mentally become insane, turn to violent crime and murder, all right? Now, to make a long story short, now, the uh, here's what he did. In particular, he latched on to the story of a young man named Victor Lakata, L-I-C-A-T-A, who had hacked his family to death with an axe, supposedly while high on cannabis. It was discovered years later, however, that Victor Lakata had a history of mental illness in his family and there was no proof he ever used the drug. So what Harry D. Anslinger and others did, they used the media. They wrote articles uh, in, in newspapers, things like this. They used radio to, to scare America about marijuana. There was a movie called Reefer Madness, which is part of that whole propaganda campaign. They used the media to influence the way people think, feel, act, and behave, to then justify them uh, uh, prohibit making marijuana illegal. The problem was there was little scientific evidence that supported Anslinger's claims. He contacted 30 scientists, according to uh, Hari in his book, and 29 told uh, Anslinger, uh, his, uh, told him cannabis was not a dangerous drug. But it was the theory of the single expert who agreed with him that he presented to the public. So he takes the he takes the outlier theory and presents that to the public as truth. Cannabis wasn't an, was an evil that should be banned. And the press ran with this sensationalized version. Here's another picture of him bald. I don't know whether he lost his hair or had cancer or what have you, but this is white supremacy again. The second component to Anslinger's strategy was racial. He claimed that black people and Latinos were the primary users of marijuana and it made them forget their place in the fabric of American society. It made them uppity Negroes. It made them forget 
their place in the fabric of American society. He even went so far as to argue that jazz musicians were creating, creating satanic music all thanks to the influence of pot. The obs this obsession eventually led to a sort of, of witch hunt against the legendary Billy Holiday. Now, Harry J. Anslinger was portrayed in the movie, The United